Good afternoon, everybody. Today we're going to talk about another way to prevent viral infection, and that is by using antiviral drugs, which you can take if you're infected, you haven't had time to have a vaccine. So as we said last time, vaccines can prevent diseases, but if you are already infected, they're not going to be terribly useful. And we talked about one exception. Does anyone know or remember what that might be? Rabies. Yeah, it's good. I'm glad I like it when you answer right away, especially. It means I'm doing the right thing. Yes, with rabies, you can um, get vaccinated, although they will give you monoclonals or antibodies first. So what we do in, in all the other cases except for rabies is we use antivirals. And these can stop infections once they've begun, although you can't be too far into an infection for this to work, as you will see. 50, for 50 years or more, we have been uh, looking for antiviral drugs, but we hardly have any. There are about 30 or more today, and most of them are against HIV. The vast majority of these antivirals are against HIV, and then there are a bunch against herpes viruses. And it's obvious why we have so many against HIV, of course, and uh, the herpes viruses also. These are viruses that stay with you forever, so it's, it's a good target for an antiviral. So here is a table showing you really the viruses for which we have antivirals. Uh, influenza, there are uh, two different classes of antivirals. We'll talk about them today. The herpes viruses, look at them all. Uh, there are antivirals for all of those. Uh, HIV, hepatitis C virus is beginning to get bigger in terms of the number of antivirals. Uh, there was initially a, a really bad combination of ribavirin and interferon, and now we have two brand new inhibitors we'll talk about. And you can see that there are various targets for these antivirals, uh, and we're going to talk a lot about those today. But this is pretty meager, and there are a lot of reasons for this, and we'll get into this today. Why are there so few? One of the main problems is that um, these compounds can have side effects. As you know, viruses are intimately in uh, integrated into the cell. I shouldn't say integrated. You're going to misread that. They're not, in all, they're not all integrated. They need the cell in order to replicate, right? So it's very hard to make a drug which will hit just the virus and have no side effects. It's not impossible, but it's difficult. Um, so you don't want to have side effects, of course, because people won't take them and they could be bad, uh, and so you have to be very clever, and this is not easy, so that takes a long time. So that's one reason that it's difficult to find antivirals. Another reason is that a lot of these viruses are difficult to work with in themselves. You, you, they're either very dangerous, or they can't be grown in cell culture, or there are no animal models for testing them, and that has really hampered the discovery of antivirals. Now, a lot of these issues are being overcome. In the last 10 years or so, people are being very clever. So now, for example, to look for Ebola uh, antivirals, we don't need to grow the virus. Uh, but animal models are important. You have to have animals to test antivirals in. And the FDA has a two-animal rule. You have to show that your antiviral is good in two animal models before you can go on to test it in people. And that can be difficult. And here is the third reason, which may be the most critical. Antiviral drugs have to be totally effective. Okay, so you take pharmaceuticals of all sorts. You have even the stuff you take for headaches or muscle aches. These are not 100% effective. They work enough to make you feel better. But you have to completely inhibit virus replication. Uh, Otherwise, you're going to get mutants, as you will see. So partial inhibition is not an acceptable outcome for an antiviral drug. You have to have 100% inhibition. So they have to be potent and safe. So safety, obviously, we talked about potent. They have to inhibit replication 100%, essentially, because if you have a little bit of viruses replicating, you're going to select for resistant mutants. And in fact, um, replication in the presence of an antiviral is how you get resistant mutants. So again, this is really a key point. A lot of the pharmaceuticals that we take for other conditions that inhibit various enzymes or other targets in our body, they're not 100% uh, inhibitory, but antivirals uh, have to be. So here's a graph of what happens if you change the dose of an antiviral. Uh, 
and the effect on replication. So here is a, a time course where we're looking at virus produced and we're using three different levels of drug. Uh, a low dose, an intermediate, and the optimal dose, which has been t determined in the laboratory, of course. So you give the optimal dose, you inhibit virus replication with time, as almost 200%. But if you give intermediate doses, you get some replication. Uh, and then you get emergence of resistant viruses, which grow. And it's even worse for low doses. So this is an artificial experiment because we're varying the dose, but if you had a drug which was not 100% efficacious or 100% inhibitory, you'd have the same effect and you would get resistant mutants. So that's why, those are the reasons why we don't have a lot of drugs. Um, there's another reason though, and that is these acute infections are short, that by definition, right? So, you know, a week, in, uh, a week disease period or so, by the time you feel ill, it's really too late to have an impact on disease. So you have to give them very early. You have to have rapid diagnostics, which we don't have, uh, and try and give them early. So we have antivirals for flu. You have to take those within the first 24 to 48 hours of feeling sick. If you don't, they have no effect. And even at 24 to 48 hours, it's a bit late already, because by the time you have symptoms, you have quite a bit of virus in you. So this is a problem with these acute infections. It's not an issue with chronic infections, HIV and the herpes viruses, which are around for years. That is easy. But these acute infections, which as you know, are a huge health, health burden, flu uh, and rhinoviruses, rotaviruses, noroviruses, would be great to have a way to make antivirals for them. Now, we don't have any broad spectrum antivirals. You know, if, you, if you're suspected of having an infection, a bacterial infection, you go to a physician, you get a broad spectrum antiviral until they can figure out what bacterium you have and then they can get more specific. But we don't have that uh, for viruses. Although people are working on it, and I'm gonna show you an example of this uh, in a moment. Now, um, this ish let's revisit this issue a little more, this, this quickness issue of acute infection. So you get sick, uh, then you have to go to a physician. Let's say we had antiviral drugs for rhinoviruses. You'd have to go to a physician and get diagnosed and get a prescription and go fill it. And that's, there's just not enough time to do that. With influenza, as I've mentioned before, if you show up at a doctor's office and you have what looks like flu, influenza-like illness, uh, fever high, and cough, for example, and it's the flu season, that would just give you a prescription for Tamiflu, an antiviral, without even doing any tests, because you're likely to have influenza. But you know, maybe half the time you actually don't have influenza. But if you have some other respiratory infection, well, we don't have any antivirals, but we'd have to figure out which one it was to give you the right antiviral. So that's a problem. We don't have any rapid diagnostic, diagnostic tests for anything except flu. Uh, and, that, and so companies are not going to make antivirals for these viruses because nobody's going to buy them. So someday we will have rapid tests that are really, really good. I don't know if I've told you this already, but my view is one day we're gonna wake up in the morning and when you go in front of your mirror, there's gonna be a sensor in the mirror and it's gonna scan you and it's gonna say, virus free today, have a nice day. <laughs> I really believe that, I think we're gonna have that. And then if, you've, if there is a virus found in you, except for the ones we all have every day, it's gonna send that information to your physician and then you, you go to work and on the way pick up a prescription and take care of it. I really think that's going to happen, non-invasive scanning, but it's going to be a ways off. You remember Star Trek, they had the tricorder thing, right? It's the same idea. Uh, and, and in fact, I, I may have told you this, I'm sorry if I'm repeating it, but there's a company who has a, a contest, Qualcomm, has a $10 million prize to uh, develop a tricorder-like apparatus to diagnose 10 different diseases. So at some point, we'll have something like that, and then uh, companies will make lots of antivirals for these rapidly developing infections. But in the meantime, we don't have any. All right, let's go back to broad spectrum antivirals. You know, there are broad spectrum antibacterials, tons of antibiotics that you can give to people and early on before you know what infects them. But we don't have them for viruses. But there, is, uh, there was a report published um, last year out of UCLA and they, they described a compound called LJ1001, which apparently inhibits the replication of enveloped viruses. So these are all the viruses they tested in the paper. And now these all, you should know all of these. You should know what they are more or less with the exception of a couple of weird ones. But you've got Ebola and influenza, 
let's see, yellow fever, hepatitis. Uh, so all of these viruses with an envelope are pretty much all inhibited. Here is the column activity of the antiviral pluses means they inhibit uh, virus replication. Not terribly good against pox viruses. But then these viruses which are not enveloped here, adenovirus, Coxsackie B related to polio, and rheovirus, a rotavirus-like virus, these are not inhibited. So this, this compound is apparently specific for enveloped viruses. And uh, how does it work? Well, that's a good question. Here is the compound right there. And it's believed that it inserts into the lipid membrane of the virus and basically trashes the membrane, possibly by this phenolic uh, ring structure here at the end, stick into membrane. So here are some electron micrographs of uh, vesicular stomatitis virus, that bullet-shaped rhabdovirus uh, that have been treated. And here's, here's the, uh, uh, the, the control, which is just the diluent used to dissolve the drug, and these are intact bullet-shaped virions. And here is a related compound that is not active in inhibiting virus replication, LJ25. And you can see these viruses are all okay. And here is LJ1001, uh, and you can see all these viruses are trashed. Uh, here's one intact one down here, but they're all broken up, and this is a, a magnification. So the idea is that this inserts into the membrane of the envelope virus and breaks it, essentially, makes it non-infectious. Now these compounds you would think might have toxicity, right? Just they're going into the cell membrane, but they don't apparently. The cells seem to be healthy. And the idea is that cell membranes are always regenerating, right? A cell membrane is a dynamic entity that's always regenerating. But once you have a virus that's bud off from the cell, it can't regenerate its membrane. And so you can trash it. Whether or not these will work in animals is another question and have any toxicity at all. But if they pass and they get the clinical trials and are efficacious, these would be great because um, a lot of those viruses um, could be instantly treatable. But you know, using a broad spectrum may not be great because then you're going to encourage resistance and so forth. But we'll, we'll deal with that when the day comes that these are approved. So let me tell you a little bit about how antivirals were first discovered uh, in this field. First, first ones came in the 1950s, actually. So many, many years after antibiotics were discovered. But in fact, it, were, it was the antibiotics, and in particular the sulfas, which led to chemists to say, maybe we could do similar things uh, for viruses. And so the first ones were thiosemicarbazones, which are chemicals active against pox viruses. After World War II in this country, pox viruses were still a problem. In fact, they were infecting a lot of people in 1967 and just eradicated in 1979. I, I wanted to tell you at the end of last lecture that even though smallpox is eradicated, it is a bioterrorism threat. And consequently, the US is stockpiling vaccines and antivirals. So brand new antivirals have been made by a couple of companies, and the US is stockpiling hundreds of millions of doses of these in case the, the, someone walks into a city with smallpox and starts spreading the infection. Uh, in the 1960s and 70s, uh, you know, these, there was some success here. Companies started doing blind screens. Okay, So what is, that is, is you take some mixture of compounds, and you take your virus, and you add the compounds to cell culture, and you see if they inhibit the replication of your virus. So that's a blind screen. You don't know where in the infectious cycle you're going to hit with the compound. And if you're using mixtures, you don't even know what the compound is. You have to figure that out later. <clears throat> so there's no attempt to focus on a virus-specific mechanism. And what was tested were random chemicals. So companies would have libraries of thousands and thousands of chemicals. They would just take them and throw them into cell culture and see if they inhibit the virus. Uh, natural product mixtures. You go out into the environment and you, you collect some dirt and you culture it in the lab and you see what products are made. Soil bacteria produce all kinds of chemicals and so you see if any of those will inhibit your virus. Then you get some hits, which are compounds or mixtures that block your uh, replication. Then you try and purify these and see what the active ingredient is. And once you get that, then you those are called leads, and you have to modify them by chemists. You have to make them less, to less toxic. You have to, have to make them soluble, bioavailable. If you inject them, they have to get into the right target. If you swallow them, they have to get to the right target. That's what bioavailability, pharmacokinetic properties, how long they last, uh, 
in the blood, for example. So you have to modify these leads and then go back and make sure they inhibit over and over. So this is quite an arduous process. And we actually don't do this anymore, as you will see. So this was done in many companies trying to inhibit many viruses, but little success. With one exception here, a antiviral called Symmetrel, that's the trade name, or Amantadine, that's this weird little molecule over here. And that was improved in the 1960s to treat influenza uh, A virus infections. And it's still available, although there's pretty widespread resistance to it. And this season, it's basically useless. Uh, but it's, it's still used in some cases. We didn't even know the mechanism of action until the 1990s. We'll talk about that later. But again, this was approved without knowing how it inhibited the virus. Now today, this field is totally revolutionized. And the tools available are fantastic if we had, as I said, rapid diagnostic tests. Many more companies would be using these tools uh, to look for antivirals. But they are doing so for certain viruses, so we'll talk about them. We use recombinant DNA technology. You can clone genes and express them and look for inhibitors of them. So you have a, a virus that has an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, right? You can clone that gene, express it in cells, and look for drugs that inhibit it. You don't have to have the whole virus. So you go through the whole screening process, you make something that inhibits the, the enzyme, and then you go and see if it inhibits virus replication. We know that uh, we know the life cycles for many of these viruses. We've talked about some of them here in this course. So we can ask, what part of the life cycle do we want to inhibit? You don't just go blindly and inhibit replication. You say, I want to inhibit entry or nucleic acid synthesis or something else. And so even if you can't grow viruses, we can look for antivirals because we can look at specific enzymes. No more blind screening. We do this very, very focused uh, drug development and discovery. So now that you know the uh, replication cycle of many viruses, you can imagine how we could use it to target a virus. So if you're working in a drug discovery program in a company, and you've identified a virus for which there's a medical need to make an antiviral, you could look at the replication cycle and say, do we know enough about a particular step to be able to design an inhibitor? And all the steps are game for inhibitors. You could look at entry, and we certainly have entry inhibitors for HIV and influenza. Uh, you can look at nucleic acid replication. There are many, many inhibitors that target it. These are called nucleoside or non-nucleoside analogs. We'll talk about those for HIV and herpes viruses. Uh, the maturation of viruses requires proteases in some cases, and you can find very readily inhibitors of those. Uh, release of virus, we have one for influenza that targets that step. That's a neuraminidase uh, inhibitor. Uh, and then for many, many years, and still we treat in, uh, hepatitis C infections and a few others with interferon. This is not very effective, less than 50% uh, efficacy and it's got side effects as you know right I, was, I told you a long time ago interferon can be dangerous it, it induces all these ISGs that have all sorts of side effects so you feel pretty lousy when you're on interferon plus it doesn't work uh, so fortunately we have better drugs now for hepatitis C so how do you discover antiviral compounds it's a really long and expensive process you start with a medical need Okay, you have to have, if you're working in a pharmaceutical company, you have to consider profit because that's what drives your industry. So you have to have a medical need, some infection that, in, that occurs in many people, and that will be profitable so that you can drive your industry. If you only have a few hundred of infections a, a year, it's not likely that a major company will want to make an antiviral for that. You have to do some research to figure out the different steps that you might target. Now, fortunately, academic labs do a lot of this, so we elucidate all the steps in replication of different viruses. So you can pick whatever your mechanism is. Let's say you decide you want to inhibit a viral protease. What you really need to do, first of all, is to show that that protease is essential for viral replication. So you have to make a mutation in the gene or delete it and show that the virus can't replicate without it. Because you don't want to go through looking for an inhibitor of a protease, and then find out later that the protease is non-essential. That would be, you'd get fired, basically. You wouldn't even get to that point. So you have to do um, a proof of principle. That's this very important thing here. So now you have, a, say, a protease you want to target. You now get your libraries of chemicals, natural products, collections that companies have. There are companies now that sell collections 
of chemicals that are targeted for specific activity. So you can buy protease inhibitors already packaged, thousands and thousands of chemicals. You can, you can buy libraries of FDA-approved drugs and run them through your stream and find a, a drug that was approved for something else but now maybe inhibits your virus. And that would make approval a lot quicker. And then you run your screens with your collections of compounds and you get your hits uh, and then you go on to uh, modify those into leads. You have to have the chemists now come into the picture and start modifying them so they're more active. You may not get optimal activity initially with your hits, make them more active. Uh, you then have to start putting them into animals and making sure they're bioavailable, they have good pharmacokinetics, they're not toxic and so forth. And these are some of the main questions you have to answer. Will it get to the right place? So you need an animal model. If you have an animal susceptible to measles, you have to show that giving the drug uh, by the route that you have picked, orally is usually preferable, but it's not always possible, uh, will inhibit the disease. So that's bioavailability. Will the compound persist long enough to be effective? That's pharmacokinetics. Does it degrade really quickly, which is not good because then people have to take the drug every day, or does it last a long time? And the chemists can help you. They can modify it. Then you take the modified compound, you go back to your assay, and make sure they still inhibit. If they don't inhibit, you call up the chemists and say, no good, we need, we need pharmacokinetics, but we still need activity. So there's a lot of collaboration between virologists and chemists. And finally, toxicity and specificity. Is it going to be safe? You can tell a little bit about toxicity in cell culture. So you throw it away if it's toxic in cell culture, you don't even go beyond that. And then when you get into animal models, you can measure toxicity in a variety of ways. And that's when pathologists start to come into play. They'll give the animal the antiviral, and then they will dissect it and look at sections of different organs, measure liver enzymes, and see if there's any evidence of toxicity. Of course, you can't talk to animals, so there sometimes are effects that you don't detect until after the drug is approved, and it's in many, many millions of people. And that's just uh, one of the things that you have to deal with. So these are some of the hurdles in, um, in drug development. So you start with hundreds of thousands of compounds. So again, you've bought libraries or you've got natural products collections. And you start running them through your screen. So we're looking at what happens at every step. So you, have, you screen first for your antiviral effect or an inhibitory effect on your target in cells. You start to throw away them, uh, the ones that are that are toxic in cells, uh, you throw away those as well. You start to look at whether they will work in an animal, and then you have to throw away some as well. Uh, you, th you look at toxicity in animals, and again, you throw away more. And by the time you get to humans, you're probably only looking at one drug because it's too expensive to do more than one. You don't have the luxury of saying, going to your director and saying, I have 10 drugs that inhibit. Let's try them all on people. Because there's no way. You, they cost 100 to $200 million for a phase one clinical trial in people. So there's no way you're going to do that. So you have to pick one. And then you do phase one, phase two, and phase three. You do toxicity in a phase one, of course, and some dosage. And then maybe if you are lucky, five to 10 years down the line, you have a drug uh, that will work. So it's a really tough process to do it. And I had a friend who worked uh, in the uh, pharmaceutical industry, and he said some of the best most successful people in the industry are the ones who reject drugs all the time because they save the company a lot of money. It seems counterintuitive, right, because you never get a drug in the end, but companies don't want you to be working on a lot of drugs at once. So there are big problems with this industry because it's profit-driven, and so you have to make money, and so you make a lot of decisions that are based on that. I think it's somewhat flawed, and I have always thought that a nonprofit would be a good way to develop drugs. All of my friends who work in industry tell me I'm crazy and I don't understand what drives the, de the development of drugs. But I think you know, a government could set up research institutes throughout the country, staff them with smart scientists, provide incentives, and have them develop drugs. And then when they get them, they can give them to a company to develop. But that's, uh, that's not the way this country works. We're a free market capital system, so we don't have these kinds of institutes. So let's talk about a couple of assays to show you how clever people get for, in looking for antiviral drugs. These, these are assays that have been used to discover compounds. This is a mechanism-based screen. So here we're looking for a protease inhibitor. So you want to set up a screen that's really, really 
uh, high throughput, you can do a lot of compounds, and is really easy to read out. You want to have any complicated readouts. Color or spectrophotometry would be great. Enzyme readouts would be great. But you know, if you have to look into a cell culture dish and measure the killing of cells by viruses, it's not really good. So here's an assay where we have engineered <clears throat> a little synthetic peptide made up of a couple of amino acids which we know could be recognized by the viral protease, so you have to figure that out ahead of time. And you put on one end a fluorescent marker or a uh, luminescent marker of some kind, gives off light, and at the other end is a, is a bead. And then when your protease cuts this substrate, uh, you can then spin out the bead and measure the amount of light-producing substance in the supernatant. Okay, so it's a very easy assay. You add the protease to the substrate, and then you spin it out, to see how much bead has been separated by the cleavage. And so this is the kind of reaction you would get over time. Uh, so you're releasing more and more of the fluorescent tag with time. And then you can see you could add an inhibitor or candidate inhibitors to this. You could run many reactions. You can do this in multi-well formats where there are hundreds and hundreds of wells on a plastic dish. And it can be automated to read. You put a different compound in each well and you see which ones inhibit the protease. So this was actually used to develop inhibitors of HIV proteases. So here's a cell-based screen. So that was a screen done entirely in vitro. No cells were involved. Sometimes you want to use cells for a variety of reasons. Uh, this is another assay used to look for proteases, protease inhibitors for HIV. And here uh, they engineered bacteria to be the readout. And what these bacteria were engineered, they have a uh, what's called a tetracycline efflux protein in the outer membrane. So if you treat these bacteria with tetracycline, which would normally inhibit them, uh, the, the bacteria pump out the tetracycline. So they're basically resistance. resistance. So you engineer a protease site for the HIV protease into one of these loops, such that if it's cut by the protease, the pump will be inactive. So now these bacteria are tetracycline sensitive. So when you add the protease, you have tetracycline sensitivity, which you can easily measure by bacterial growth. And then if you have an inhibitor of the protease that works, it inhibits the protease, the cleavage doesn't occur, and you now have an active tetracycline pump, and these bacteria are resistant, so they will grow. So you can use bacterial growth as a measure of the efficacy of your compound. So there are lots and lots of, of assays like this, extremely clever but also allowing you to look through many, many compounds uh, in a short period of time. So today, these kinds of assays, and many, many more, are used by companies to look for antivirals. Um, and they, we have the, they have these kinds of approaches. They're high throughput, so you can look at 10,000 compounds a day, and not just one or two that you would have if you just had an individual person doing the assays. There are lots and lots of chemical libraries available as I mentioned. Uh, some companies still look at natural products. So again, this is you go outside and you collect dirt or water or some kind of sample that has microbial life and they produce metabolites that may have antiviral activity. You can also use chemistry to make libraries of compounds. So you start with a base compound and add uh, side groups at different parts of it, and you can make many, many hundreds of, chemi of chemicals that way. So many big companies have entire chemistry departments devoted to this. There's also an area called structure-based design. You solve the structure of a viral protein. Let's say you solve the structure of the neuraminidase of influenza virus uh, bound with sialic acid, which is its substrate. And then you can look at that and say, can we make a compound that mimics the sialic acid fitting into the substrate active site of the enzyme. And of course you do this computationally and then you, be, you begin to build compounds uh, that will fit in that pocket. You have to try and predict. Now this field began about 20 years ago and all the early molecules that people meet, made never fit into the structures in the right way. So people got very discouraged. But as you will see, it ended up working for the neuraminidase and so it is a good approach. Uh, and finally, you can do in silico screening. You can use computers just to try and match up inhibitors with molecules and then use that to throw out a lot of molecules that might not work, and you don't have to do the actual screen for them. So if you go to a company that is doing high throughput screening, you will see lots and lots of robots. Uh, these are just big machines that take these multi-well plates. Now, some of you may be familiar with 96-well plates 
plates that you use for tissue culture. Uh, these, these wells, these plates have over a thousand uh, wells in them. They're very, very tiny, and a robot can inject material into many wells at a time. And these robot arms here uh, will pick up uh, the individual uh, trays containing these individual plates. They will place them on a table. They will inject, you know, your whatever your assay is along with the inhibitors. They will pick them up and put them back in an incubator and it will incubate. When it's done, they will pull them out and read the assay. So completely automated. And these companies will have lots of these. That way they can go through many, many compounds a day. All the investigator has to do is to put the right chemicals in the right tanks and start them running. And then at the end, the assay is read by a computer and all the material goes in. And you can sit home and read the results out while you're sipping uh, your coffee or your tea. You can do it across the country, I guess, across the world. All right, so that's how we discover drugs. And we'll talk about some, some of the drugs and how they work in a moment. But uh, before we do that, we have to talk a little bit about resistance because this is always a problem. Anytime you make any antiviral drug, you're going to have resistance to it. Um, you have to anticipate it because viruses replicate really well. They make lots of progeny, as you know, and they, have, they can have pretty high mutation frequencies. The RNA viruses have incredible mutation frequencies. DNA virus is a little bit lower, but they still mutate. So if you have viruses that grow really well, like HIV, and they replicate for long periods of time, 10 to 15 years for HIV, long periods for hepatitis B and C viruses, this is a real problem because during the course of treatment, you're going to have the emergence of resistance, always. And we have, in fact, identified mutants that are resistant to every drug that we have today in our arsenal. The 30-plus drugs that we have, there are viruses out there that are resistant to them. And that's a problem because we don't have many antiviral drugs. It would be okay if we had hundreds and hundreds and you could switch, but it's difficult. And I'll talk about how we deal with this in terms of HIV. But that is the only virus so far that we can deal with in the way that we'll talk about. Now, of course, when you do get drug resistance, then the drug becomes useless for the patient. You have to stop giving it to the patient. Uh, and hopefully there is another drug available, and you can use that. And we tend to take these drug-resistant viruses and study them. We identify the mutations and figure out how they work in hopes of maybe designing a, a next generation antiviral that gets around it. So some of the HIV inhibitors have, have worked in that way. So here are just some numbers to start off. We'll revisit this later on. But as you know, RNA viruses have, er well, all, all polymerases are error prone. Uh, but the RNA viruses are particularly problematic because their RNA polymerases can't correct errors. DNA polymerases typically can, uh, RNA polymerases cannot. So these RNA viruses end up making one mistake or one misincorporation for every 10,000 to 100,000 nucleotides that they polymerize. And that's about a million times higher mutation frequency than our DNA polymerases, our DNA genomes. So in, in practical matters, if your RNA viral genome is 10 kilobases long, 10,000 bases, uh, in, there is a mutation in 1 to 10 genomes, according to that frequency. And 1 to 10 genomes is not a lot. Every infected cell makes tens of thousands of new genomes. So you can see this is a real problem. DNA polymerases are, are correctable. They can correct their mistakes. So they, therefore, they evolve much more slowly, although you still get resistance to drugs among DNA viruses. And here's just a diagram of how this works. Here we're showing a DNA polymerase copying a template, right? It's going, making a template strand, a negative strand, in this case, going from five to three prime in terms of synthesis. Uh, it makes a mistake shown by the mismatch here. And, and polymerases do this. They're not perfect. Every now and then they make a mistake. Uh, but the DNA polymerase has a mechanism to sense that there's a mismatch. They have an exonuclease activity, a three to five prime exonuclease. So it will chew back until it reaches this mis-base paired region. It will remove the, the mis-base paired base, and then the polymerase gets a second chance. So the DNA is, has fewer errors in it, but it's not free of errors, again, because the, the correction isn't perfect. Biology, as you know, isn't perfect. So even DNA viruses make mutations, but they evolve far more slowly uh, than RNA viruses. So keep that in mind, this resistance. We'll come back with, as we discuss individual antivirals now, we'll, in some cases we'll talk about uh, resistance mechanisms. 
Now, many compounds that we have developed as antivirals are nucleoside and nucleotide analogs. So here in the middle are the four nucleosides for DNA, A, G, T, and C. That is the base joined to the ribose. That's a nucleoside. When you put phosphates on, then it becomes nucleotide. And so what we do is we make derivatives, chemical derivatives of these, which are incorporated into the nucleic acid, but they end up terminating the chain. We'll look at this in more detail in a moment. So you can see all of these compounds on the outside where the arrows are leading to, these have been modified in some way such that they cannot be extended once they're in DNA. Okay, and the one, one we're going to look at first here is acyclovir, which you can see is a derivative of guanosine. And you can see what has been done in acyclovir. The bottom of the ribose has basically been chopped off here. Uh, and that's called acyclovir. It's used for herpes viruses. It's very effective anti-herpes drug. It works really well. Uh, and there is a more recent uh, derivative called gancyclovir, which has activities against different herpes viruses. And you can see it's, uh, it's got some chemical additions here. But these two compounds cannot be extended. So let's, let's see what this is all about. This is the mechanism of action of acyclovir. Now, uh, in general, you can't get phosphorylated uh, nucleosides into cells. Like ATP, if you add to the cell, it won't get in. So this, but a nucleoside without any phosphates will get into a cell. It can get through the cell membrane. So acyclovir, when you take it, it gets into your cells. However, in order to be incorporated into DNA, it has to be phosphorylated. It has to have three phosphates put on it, and then the DNA polymerase will incorporate it. And this is actually an incredibly clever approach, just arrived at by serendipity. Um, this first phosphorylation event takes place uh, by a herpes virus enzyme called thymidine kinase. So that makes this drug specific for herpes virus infected cells. It does not get phosphorylated in cells that are not infected. So the toxicity is very low. And this parenthetically, the thymidine kinase gene is the gene that made Dr. Silverstein famous. He's not here, so I can, I can make fun of him. But he used this gene. So Dr. Silverstein has a patent or had a patent, which is expired, to put DNA into cells. And he did this by taking the TK gene and mixing it with DNA, putting it in cells. And then you use a drug that selects for the presence of the TK gene. And so that was patented by Columbia University many years ago and has generated a lot of income for the university, as well as the inventors, Silverstein, Richard Axel, and a couple of others. So the TK gene made him famous. OK, so um, you know, TK phosphorylates acyclovir, and then two cellular kinases add the next two phosphates here. And now you have acyclovir triphosphate, which the DNA polymerase will take very happily and put it into DNA. And remember, this is a virus-infected cell, so uh, it will inhibit the virus. Uh, it will probably inhibit cellular polymerase in that cell as well, but that's really not a, a big deal because uh, you really want to get rid of the infection. So what the, the problem is, though, because this doesn't have a hydroxyl, it can't be, the chain cannot be extended. So the chain stops there, and it inhibits DNA synthesis. Now remember, acyclovir triphosphate is made from guanosine. So guanosine normally has the, the whole ribose ring here, right, with the hydroxide. And the hydroxide is what allows the next base to be added. But acyclovir doesn't have it. And so the next base can't be added, so the chain stops. And when the chain stops, that's the end of DNA synthesis. So imagine a herpes virus infected cell with lots of viral DNA molecules replicating. That stops the infection right there. So this is very effective. It's very low toxicity and very effective, still used uh, this day. If you, go, if you go to a physician and you have cold sores from herpes, they'll likely give you uh, acyclovir topically. You just put it on the cold sore, and it works really well. Now, there are some herpes infections for which you need to have systemic antiviral, and so you take it orally. So this is one of those um, valacyclovir. So initially, they started treating these patients with acyclovir many years ago. So you say you have herpes encephalitis. You need to get uh, oral or intravenous drug. But acyclovir isn't absorbed very well from the stomach and intestine. It's not bioavailable. So they made a derivative. The chemists made a derivative. Here, all they did was add a valine onto the acyclovir. So it's now called val valacyclovir. 
And I'm, I'm sure they arrived at this by lots of trial and error. But this derivative is really absorbed very well from the stomach. It's bioavailable. And then once it gets into cells, there is an enzyme that cleaves off the valine and makes acyclovir. So it's perfect. It works perfectly. Again, low toxicity, high bioavailability, and this will inhibit uh, herpes viruses beyond the cold sore, if you will. Now, unfortunately, uh, resistance to acyclovir does emerge, and this is because the DNA polymerase does make mistakes, although it's not very frequent. There are two kinds of mutants. Some mutants cannot phosphorylate the drug, the prodrug, so we call acyclovir a prodrug because it has to be phosphorylated in order to be inhibitory. These, are, ha these have changes in the viral TK gene. So the TK gene mutates so that uh, it cannot phosphorylate the drug. And so the drug never gets phosphorylated, it never gets put into the DNA, so it's not inhibitory. Other resistant mutants cannot incorporate the phosphorylated drug into DNA. Uh, and these are in the viral DNA polymerase gene. So two classes of mutants that give rise to uh, acyclovir resistance. These are a particular problem in AIDS patients who often have disseminated herpes virus infections. You have to treat them with oral or intravenous uh, valcyclovir, for example, and they may get disseminated disease. So you rely on these drugs to keep the disease in check. And again, because you're treating them for long periods of time, you often get resistance. There is one option in that case is there is another uh, inhibitor called Foscarnet, which is a DNA polymerase inhibitor. Unfortunately, this has a lot of side effects, many more so than um, valacyclovir. And um, you may also end up getting resistance to Foscarnet. So the kinds of TK resistance involving the viral DNA polymerase are often uh, resistant to Foscarnet. So in this case, there's nothing you can do because you've exhausted the antiviral uh, armamentarium against herpes viruses. So these patients are, don't have a good prognosis, obviously. Another uh, interesting antiviral is amantadine, which I mentioned briefly, this, this antiviral uh, for influenza. And this is very interesting because of the mechanism, and we have discussed how influenza virus gets into cells already. Remember, the virus binds a receptor, a sialic acid-containing receptor. It's taken up by endocytosis. As the endosome acidifies, the hemagglutinin undergoes a conformational change and you get fusion between the virus and the cell membrane. All right, now as this is also happening, there's a protein in the virion called the M2 protein, which is an ion channel, and that allows protons to get into the interior of the virion. It disrupts the RNP from the membrane and lets it get in the nucleus. So acidification of the endosome is important for fusion. Acidification of the virion interior is also important so the RNA can get out of the particle and into the nucleus. Amantadine blocks this channel. It fits right into the channel and blocks it. In fact, our knowledge of entry of this virus comes because of this drug. You can inhibit entry and people figured out how it worked and they said, ah, you need acidification to get the RNPs to come out. So this is a schematic of the M2 ion channel here, are two of the uh, four polypeptide chains that make up the ion channel. So this would be the virion membrane. And if this is the virion interior down here, the protons are coming in from the endosome lumen, which would be up at the top. The protons would be pumped in, will be passing through the channel. Amantadine is shown here as this molecule. It fits right in the channel and it blocks the proton. So it blocks acidification of the virion. So the virion is in the endosome. It's now fused and opened up to the cytoplasm, but all these RNPs remain stuck on the membrane because the low pH hasn't occurred. So they can't get off. Infection is blocked. So that's how amantadine works. Now, it's very easy to get resistance. You only need one amino acid change in, in this channel in the area where it interacts with amantadine, and the drug doesn't bind anymore. Uh, and it's no longer effective. Uh, there are also some mutations that allow the drug to be present, but the ions can somehow get through. So apparently they change the conformation of the channel. So that's not a very useful drug. The two drugs we use today for flu are neuraminidase inhibitors. And these were designed by structure-based design. So the structure of the neuraminidase, which is shown on the right, was determined. Uh, you remember the neuraminidase is one of two glycoproteins 
in the virus particle, right? The hemagglutinin attaches to cells. The neuraminidase is actually an enzyme. It's this blue one here. And when the viruses are budding, the neuraminidase cleaves sialic acids from the cell surface so that the newly made viruses don't remain bound and they can go away. So the neuraminidase is very important for allowing newly made viruses to go away from the cell. So they, the idea was if you made an inhibitor of this neuraminidase, you could block virus particles from being released from the cell surface. And that's how these inhibitors work. So when the structure of the neuraminidase was solved, it's shown here on the right, here is sialic acid fitting into the pocket. So normally the substrate for, for neuraminidase is sialic acid. Sialic acid fits in the pocket. The neuraminidase then cleaves it off from the rest of the glycoprotein. So inhibitors were designed that would mimic the structure of sialic acid and fit in this pocket and inhibit the enzyme. So those were made by structure-based design going from uh, the structure of the neuraminidase and sialic acid. So here are the two drugs that you can get today. Again, if you go to your physician and you have a flu-like illness in uh, the flu season, you can get one of these two, uh, zanamivir or oseltamivir. So let me get the trade names right. So this is Tamiflu and this is Relenza. And you know, chemists give these short names because the chemical names go on for pages. Uh, so these are not the trade name, Tamiflu, Relenza. Um, these mimic sialic acid, which is the natural ligand. And the idea was to make them very close to sialic acid so that if mutations in the neuraminidase occurred to get resistance to these compounds, those mutations would also block sialic acid binding in the neuraminidase and the virus would be dead. Okay, is that clear? So you make the inhibitor so close to the natural ligand that any resistance mutants are going to kill the virus itself. So that works pretty well. And here's the scheme of how, how these work. Here is uh, the host cell and it's got sialic acid and the newly budded influenza virion is shown here at the bottom. So when the newly budded virions are made, they're going to bind sialic acid uh, and the, the, the neuraminidase, which is this Y-shaped molecule, its job is to bind sialic acid and cleave it off so that the hemagglutinin doesn't stick. So uh, L-siltamivir fits in uh, the neuraminidase sialic acid binding pocket as the zanamivir. Zanamivir is a closer structural mimic of sialic acid than is oseltamivir, and that's shown in, the, in this diagram by slightly different uh, drawings of the two inhibitors. You can readily get resistance to oseltamivir by amino acid changes in the neuraminidase. These are some of the changes that have been observed in people treated with these drugs. These prevent binding of the oseltamivir, but they still maintain neuraminidase function. So these neuraminidases can still work, and so you have now neuraminidase, uh, sorry, uh, Tamiflu-resistant viruses circulating. And again, that's because the L-siltamivir isn't a perfect mimic of sialic acid, so the neuraminidase can still change to evade it, but not sialic acid. Uh, Zanamivir is harder to get resistance against because uh, it, it is more, uh, more of a structural mimic of sialic acid, and there are very few reports of resistance to this one. Uh, unfortunately, this is inhaled, so it's not taken as frequently because a lot of people don't like to inhale uh, things, especially if you have influenza, so it's not used as much. And this is the more common one, Tamiflu, which is taken orally as a pill. So Tamiflu, this is an interesting point. Tamiflu you take orally, so you've got to have enough drug getting to your respiratory tract to inhibit virus because it has to go in your stomach and be absorbed, get through your circulation, go to your tract. So it has to be very bioavailable and have good pharmacokinetics. So that's a nice example of some of the research you would have to do to get to that point. This is a table I just took from the CDC website where they track weekly uh, flu strain isolation and resistance. And these are just showing you resistance to oseltamivir and zanamivir among the, the three kinds of influenza viruses that we isolated. Uh, in, um, since October 2012. You can see um, two uh, H3N2 resistance to Tamiflu, two to H1N1, and none to Zanamivir uh, in that period. You see many, many samples are tested. Uh, all the H1N1 and H3N2 viruses are resistant to uh, amantadine, that other compound that blocks the 
m ion channel. So those aren't recommended for use at all. So if you get any uh, uh, antivirals, you get these. these. These are not enough. We need to have more. So companies are trying to make more. Flu is a good target. Uh, but we need to have many so that we have an alternative when there is resistance. Of course, vaccination is the primary way to control flu. And so that's why there aren't, I think, in part, a lot of other antivirals. I want to tell you about a, uh, another group of very interesting antivirals, which are against picornaviruses. We've talked about these briefly. Uh, these were first discovered in the 1980s. Inhibitors of picornavirus uncoding. I, I wanted you to see just this first sentence. The discovery of the antiviral drugs known today, this is 1985, can be attributed primarily to the tenacity of researchers and the serendipity of circumstances. Well, someone got very, very flagrant with their writing, didn't they? Scientific writing is never that good. So that was the case up until 1985. Now we have all these high throughput, structure-based, et cetera, methods that I've told you about. You don't have to do this anymore. Uh, basically, what they did is they found uh, an interesting compound that had some activity against picornaviruses, rhinovirus, coxsackie, polioviruses, and they modified it to make drugs. And I wanted to show you this just to give you an idea of how this works. So, you know, you start with a, a given structure and it has a certain minimal inhibitory concentration. That is, in micrograms per mil, the, the, the minimum you need to inhibit virus replication. Uh, and then they make chemical modifications to it. You can see they add carbons and various side groups, ring structures, and so forth, and then they test them in cells, inactive, a little better, inactive, inactive, the same, inactive, you know, and eventually you go through and you get compounds that, that work better. Here's an example where they simply increase the number of carbons between this phenol ring and the rest of the molecule, you know, three, four, five, six, seven, all the way to 10, and you see this has various effects. So these were the, the steps used to develop these compounds that fit into uh, the pocket of picornaviruses. We talked about these because they have allowed us to understand how entry occurs. Clinically, they are useless because you get resistance very quickly and they're not very effective therapeutically. And also, they're being used, or the idea was to use them for the common cold, which is so quick that it's really difficult to diagnose and so they're not very useful at all. Uh, the hepatitis C virus has a bunch of new pro, uh, dr antiviral drugs being developed. Uh, this is a positive strand virus that makes a polyprotein, just like picornas, and it has to be cleaved by virus proteases. Uh, so there is a protease uh, called the NS3, NS4A protease, which is encoded here, and companies have screened for inhibitors of this protease. And here are two of them that have just been licensed, Bocepravir and Telaprevir. See, these are pretty complex organic molecules. They fit into the active site of the protease. So the blue ribbon is the structure of the virus protease active site. And these are some of the active site residues. And here's one of the proteases uh, inhibitors, Bocepravir, fitting right into that pocket. So structure-based design was used to make this. These are working really well. Uh, they're much better than interferon and ribavirin. But of course, having only two is a problem because you're getting resistance already. So we need to have many more. A really interesting antiviral for hep C involves a microRNA target. Now the viral genome here shown at the top actually interacts with two microRNAs. They're called MIR-122. Uh, these bind in the five prime non-coding region. They are the binding sites right there. And they are required for virus replication. If you take these away, the virus doesn't replicate. So these are MIRs, these are microRNAs that are produced in us and in every animal. They're apparently conserved. And they're also liver specific. Okay, so this is a hepatitis virus. It replicates just in the liver and it requires this liver specific MIR. So uh, people showed first that if you knock out this MIR, the virus can't replicate. So now there has already been a clinical trial, a phase two clinical trial in people showing that if you block this MIR, it will reduce viral replication. So the way you block the mirror is you make antagomeres. These are short nucleic acids, very stable, that base pair with the mirror and prevent it from hitting its target on the viral RNA. And you give these to people with hepatitis and you, this is what happens here. So this is the HCV RNA load in their blood over time. So you, first you give them five weekly injections of either placebo or different amounts of the antagomere, which is this whole thing, 
it's called Mira Viersen, but it basically blocks Mira 122. And you can see three milligrams per kilogram of body weight, no effect, but then seven and five have good effects. And they really reduce uh, virus replication. So this is a phase two, so it's a limited study, but this has a lot of promise as an antiviral. Although, of course, mutations can occur to get resistance uh, to this as well. This is just part of the hepatitis C virus drug pipeline. There's a website devoted to this, and it goes on for pages and pages. It shows you all of the drugs that are being developed by which companies and what they're targeting. You can see protease inhibitors, um, nucleoside uh, polymerase inhibitors as well are here, and there are a whole bunch of other ones. And you can see where they are in terms of development research, preclinical, uh, phase one, two, and three, and then finally approved as a drug. It's very interesting. Uh, let's talk about some HIV antivirals because we have a ton of these and it's a pretty interesting story. We have antivirals that inhibit uh, many steps of the replication cycle, including attachment, reverse transcription, integration, uh, and virion assembly and release. Now the problem with AIDS is that it goes on for a long time, 10 to 15 years, and you make a ton of viruses every day. So this is a recipe for resistance. Uh, the first antiviral, anti-HIV drug made was AZT, azetodeoxythymidine, which is a nucleoside analog, very similar to acyclovir. It's a modified base, and it is not able to ex be extended once it's incorporated by the reverse transcriptase into DNA. So you give it to people, it gets into cells, it's phosphorylated by cellular kinases to get three phosphates on it, and then it gets incorporated into the DNA made by the RT, and then the chain stops because it's a terminator. It doesn't have the hydroxide in which to put the next base. Uh, this is not a good substrate for most cellular enzymes. It's better for the HIV RT, so it gives it some specificity. But this drug has terrible side effects. Um, but that doesn't matter, really, because when, th when the drug was first released, a lot of people were very happy to have any kind of drug at all. Unfortunately, um, there are lots of mutants. So this is an orally administered drug, but the problem is the half-life is one hour. One hour. So you have to take it every day, <laughs> multiple times a day, and uh, people don't like it because it has a lot of side effects. And this is a recipe for resistance. So you feel really bad after a week of this. You say, I'm not taking my AZT today. And then your viruses multiply, the drug-resistant viruses come up. And then when you decide to go back on AZT, it's not going to work. So mutants resistant to this drug arose right away within the first year of licensing. And these are just single amino acid changes in the reverse transcriptase enzyme. Uh, that don't bind the phosphorylated AZT. So the companies went on to make new uh, nucleoside analogs. They made these various drugs based on different nucleosides, and they work. Um, and they were often given in combinations of two. And that let you persist for a year on therapy. But again, within less than a year, you got mutants to both drugs arising in these patients. So another class of antivirals were develop. These are the non-nucleoside RT inhibitors. So the nucleoside inhibitors go in the active site. They're incorporated into the growing DNA chain, and they cause chain termination. The non-nucleoside inhibitors are small molecules that bind away from the active site. They're not actually incorporated into the chain, but they bind the reverse transcriptase and make it not work, essentially. So here is a structure of the RT. Here's the polymerase active site, and here is one non-nucleoside RT inhibitor binding to it. So it deforms the active site so it doesn't work, but it does not get in incorporated into the chain. That's why we call them non-nucleoside uh, inhibitors. And there are a bunch of them that are out now. They have names that are impossible to pronounce, so I don't try anymore. These are all fictitious names anyway, so who knows how to pronounce them properly. Here's the chemical name for this compound. Right? That's why people, the companies shorten it to nevirapine, and then when you sell it, it's called viramune. All right, so there are a bunch of these, and these were used, and uh, again, you got resistance pretty quickly uh, in amino acids in the RT that interact with uh, these small chemicals. So you can't use them alone, actually. If you use them alone, you get resistance too quickly. You use them in combination therapy. Finally, the protease inhibitors were developed, the HIV protease is absolutely required for, to make virions. It's encoded, of course, in the GAG protein. Uh, 
It's incorporated into virions as they bud from the cell. So the protease is the yellow molecule here, uh, and it's incorporated in into the growing virion. And then as the virus buds from the cell, the protease actually works after it's released from the cell to cleave the internal proteins and mature them. And it was known that this protease was essential. If you made mutations in it, the virus wouldn't replicate. So inhibitors were sought and made, which were basically mimics of the cleavage site. So here is the protease cleavage site on the viral polyprotein. Remember, these proteases cleave the viral polyprotein at specific parts. So you have a series of amino acids, a cleavage site right here between a tyrosine and a proline. So in, this is an example of one inhibitor made by one company. It is a, just a three amino acid substrate which mimics the cleavage site. So it binds into the enzyme and inhibits it. So it's a very good inhibitor. So there are a whole bunch of these that were made uh, and they, they were very effective. Uh, a couple of other kinds of inhibitors for HIV. There's an inhibitor of the integrase. Remember, that's the viral enzyme that helps to get the viral DNA integrated into the host cell. So integrase takes viral DNA. Here's the integrase protein right here, this blue circle. It takes host DNA and it nicks the host DNA and then ligates the viral DNA to it. We talked about this reaction before. And there is an inhibitor uh, sold by Merck called Raltegravir. It looks like this in the upper right. Uh, what it does is it complexes with specific amino acids of the integrase shown here. And there are actually two metals that are needed for integrase activity. Uh, the inhibitors bind to that area. They block its ability to uh, put the viral DNA into the host cell DNA. So these are really very cleverly designed inhibitors. They were structure-based design, knowing the structure of the integrase, uh, and they work quite well. There is an inhibitor of CCR5, that co-receptor needed for virus entry. Remember, HIV binds to CD4, and then it needs another protein, either CXCR4 or CCR5. People designed inhibitors that hit CCR5. We knew these would work because if you delete CCR5 from cells, the virus couldn't infect. And there's a small molecule uh, that binds uh, CCR5. It's the yellow molecule in this picture. It's called Maraviroc. And uh, it binds CCR5. It deforms it so that the virus cannot carry out its, empty, its entry step. And that's what the molecule uh, looks like there. And I think the last one is an entry inhibitor also for HIV. Uh, HIV fuses with cell membranes. It does so when the viral glycoprotein binds to the cell. And you remember in our fusion discussion, the fusion peptide is moved from a hidden place near the viral membrane up into the cellular membrane as shown here. This structure then hairpins, it folds back on itself. It brings the viral and the cellular membranes together so that they can fuse. These inhibitors are actually peptides. They're 36 amino acid synthetic peptides. There's the sequence right there. What they do is they bind to this extended uh, glycoprotein conformation, and they lock it in that position so it can't hairpin. So the two membranes can never fuse. So, so, and again, it's a very cool inhibitor. Unfortunately, this is really expensive, and you have to inject it. So patients have to do it themselves. Every day they have to take a little bit of the powder and add buffer to it, dissolve it, and then inject themselves. Of course, diabetics do that all the time, so it's not, that's not unusual, but it makes compliance with this um, difficult. And of course, you get resistance uh, quite readily. We now do combinations of three antivirals to treat HIV uh, and AIDS. This is called heart highly active antiretroviral therapy. And, and initially it was a mixture of three pills, but now there is a single pill with three different drugs in it. Each drug targets something different, you know, protease, non-nucleoside, nucleoside, entry, et cetera. Uh, and this, this basically allows you to treat the disease as a chronic disease. You can live a full life if, as long as you take these inhibitors every day. So the combination of three really has done it. And let's do some math to show you why that works. Let's say you need one mutation to be resistant to one drug, all right? Yeah, this virus, the mutation rate is one in every 10,000 bases that are polymerized. So what that means is that every 10,000 viruses that a cell makes, you have one resistance mutation, on average, of course. This is all statistics, all right? 
each base is substituted in every 10 to the fourth viruses. So everybody makes about, most of the HIV infected individuals make 10 to the 10th new viruses per day. So that, if you just divide those, that means there are a million viruses produced each day in an infected individual with resistance to any one drug. This is why resistance evolves uh, very quickly. Now, if you use two drugs, getting resistance now is, a, is a multiplying the two individual resistance frequencies. Again, one in 10,000, uh, in 10,000 viruses, you're going to have resistance to one drug. So for two, uh, you need 10 to the eighth viruses. So again, if you make 10 to the 10th viruses every day, you just do the math, you're going to make 100 viruses resistant to two drugs per day. And then if you increase it to three drugs, you now need 10 to the 12th viruses, which is more than you're producing by a long shot. And plus, remember, these drugs are suppressing replication. So presumably, you're bringing down the number of viruses you make every day. So this is why triple drug therapy works. You can get resistance, but it takes a long time. And then you can simply switch to another combination of three drugs. So you can live a full life with AIDS as long as you take these drugs. Now, if you decide to stop for a few weeks, the viruses are going to start multiplying, and there will be drug-resistant viruses in there. And when you go back on your triple therapy, it's not going to work. So it's very important that you adhere to it. So this is a list of all the available drugs against HIV, divided up by classes. And we've talked about all of these non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, uh, the non-nucleoside NRTIs, protease inhibitors, the one fusion inhibitor, the CCR5 antagonist, uh, the integrase inhibitor, Isentres. Isn't that a good name on Isentres? This is very nice. I like it. Uh, and then we have our triple combination pills. The first one was called, very uh, clever, a tripla. And then Eviplera or Eviplera. I have no idea how you would say it. These are the three drugs that are in each one. So this is very good if you have a single pill that has uh, all three in it. So it's, it's an amazing amount of antiviral work because this is a big deal, this disease, 60 million people infected and many, many uh, every year. And one more thing about this, look at the time to approval for some of these drugs. So for um, this one, Zyduvodine, three and a half months. So usually, you know, the company does all the work and they present the data to the FDA and it takes a long time for them to go through it because it's thousands and thousands of pages of data. They have to review it, they have to meet, take, can take a year or more. So they fast-tracked a lot of these drugs because this was a serious disease and this still is. And some of these are really, really quick. So this is good. People continue to develop drugs for HIV because right now it's the only thing we can do. We have no vaccine, remember. But I'll end up again with this slide that I showed you on the first day of this course, which is that there are 10 to the 16th genomes of this virus on the planet today. That's by multiplying the number of infected people with the number of genomes we know is in each person. And that number is so big that it encodes resistance. If you go back to the math that I showed you, there are resistance to every one of those antivirals on that table, plus anything we could ever make in our lifetime. So it's sort of you're chasing an elusive target really in the end and a vaccine would be really really useful uh, to get rid of this infection